But what was it that made him a, a cut above the rest of theoretical physicists? Yeah, I think he is he's rightly described as one of the greats. And uh, that's for several reasons. Um, his, his initial work was on uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is it was published in 1915. It is the framework within which we understand the universe. So it's the, the theory that tells us how space stretches or shrinks, depending on what you put in it. And, and he proved that ju given just that theory, then there has to be an origin of time. So he, he produced, wow. he essentially proved, not long after his thesis, it might even have been part of his thesis, actually, at Cambridge, that he, um, he proved that. So it's called the singularity theorem. But he then, he then went on to work on black holes, and he proved that black holes aren't entirely black. So, so a black hole is a you know, giant star that's reached the end of its life and collapsed. And, and the, I suppose the common image of a black hole is that you th throw something in and it never comes back out again. It swallows everything and emits nothing. Nothing can escape. But he showed that that was not right. He showed that they have a temperature and they glow and they radiate out into space and ultimately, over really long times, evaporate away. And uh, that's called Hawking radiation. Why, I think that forgive me for asking such a thick question, but I did warn you this was going to happen. Well, I, I can uh, see why singularity theorem is so important, because it's, it's, it's yeah. the origins of everything in a sense. But why, why was the Hawking radiation and the black hole work so significant? Uh, because we know that Einstein's theory, brilliant as it is, is not the complete description of the universe. I mean, even in A Brief History of Time, you will remember, yes. you said. You remember <laughs> don't test me, Brian, don't test me. <laughs> he, said, he said that, actually, there may not be an origin to time when you include the other great achievement of 20th century physics, which is called quantum theory, which, which deals with how atoms work and things like that. So, so when, you, when you stick those together, it may be that you dodge the need for an origin in time, but also what you do is you dodge the idea that black holes are completely black and nothing escapes. And so really the, the, the value of Hawking radiation and that theory is that it for the first time really begins to look towards that better theory, the, the theory that we need to truly understand how the universe works, so-called quantum theory of gravity. So it's a step on the road to that. So, so the theory of relativity it, being a paradigm, he, he moved the paradigm along, he moved to a new paradigm. Yeah, yeah, it's the first step, really, to that theory which we, we hope is there, and we, we hope yeah. that we are capable as human beings of, of grasping it. And it's the theory we need. If, if we really want to understand, as Hawking said beautifully at the end of A Brief History of Time, he said that if we know all this, we will mm. know the mind of God. <laughs> and and he, was, what, what, he was really talking about nature there. He was not a religious man, Hawking, but that idea... Einstein used to talk like this as well, that there's a, there's a regularity and beauty underpinning our universe that we have access to. And, and he made a bigger step on the road to that. that. That's beautifully put. And, and is that what drives um, physicists? Because laymen think of you uh, and your ilk as, as quite dusty individuals, perhaps, quite donnish and, 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 and aloof. But in fact, you're, you're, you're trying to break things down in a way that would make sense of everything. It, it, it's the most human of pursuits when, when I hear you describe Stephen Hawking in the way that you just did. It, it, it is. It's, um, it's understanding nature. It's recognising that nature, of which we are a part, is beautiful and regular, and we have access to it. I should also say that Stephen, yeah. that I got to know him later in life, and he was very funny. Um, and uh, so one thing I did, uh, for the Monty Python reunion at the O2 <laughs> Arena, um, Eric Heidel, who I got to know, rang me and said, do you know Stephen? Can you get in touch with him? I'd love him to do some sort of sketch. And so I said, yeah, I'll email him. And within about a minute, an email came back from Stephen saying yes. So we went down to... Cambridge, um, and, and Eric had come up with this sketch where I'm always criticising, uh, in, a, in a gentle way, Eric's songs, because I always say they're not really accurate. So the song called The Galaxy Song talks about the Earth going round in a circle around the sun, and I go, it's not, it's an ellipse, it's scientifically <laughs> inaccurate, there's nonsense. So, so he came up with this sketch where I would be criticising the Galaxy Song, going, well, it's just, it's just scientifically inaccurate. It's nonsense. And in the background, there's this little speck coming along past King's College in Cambridge, and it's Stephen in his wheelchair, and he runs me over and says i think you're being pedantic and then steven starts singing the galaxy song <laughs> but the, the 
I think you're being pedantic was an ad lib. So really? when we were describing it to him in his office, and, he, and by that time he was finding it very difficult to type things into his computer, um, but he typed in that and with perfect comment, comic timing said, I think you're being pedantic. And that's what you see in the in the video <laughs> that came at the O2. So he was really very, very funny. He's, he's not just in any way this kind of dusty scientist that sees not. their own things. I should also say what, one of the great things about him was he became political, not not really party political, although he was, yes. I think, a member of the Labour Party, but it wasn't that. It, it was um, that, that he, he talked about the how valuable the way of science as a way of thinking, as a humble way of thinking and a careful way of thinking is, and how our future should be bright. We have a lot of things left to do and understand as individuals and as the human race. But in order to do that, we have to think about our position in the universe as one civilization on one fragile planet much more carefully. And he became very active in, in putting that point of view. So what has what has a scientific way of thinking got to how can it inform mm. the way that we behave? And I think that was extremely important because he had a big voice. He did, and time, I mean, he wrote very powerfully about Brexit and Trump and other things. He felt that time, the times we live in were moving away from the things that he considered important, the, 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 the if you will, the rule of expertise. Yeah, I think he did. He uh, And he, th we are in, and he made this point, we're in a critical phase now as, as the human race. We're at the point where we're beginning to step off the planet for the first time. Uh, we can imagine becoming, becoming a spacefaring civilization. We also face great dangers from our own technology, but also, as he emphasised, from our stupidity <laughs> and our myo myopic tendencies to look inwards and, and petty internal conflicts in our civilization, rather than thinking about our wider value. And I think that's really... He firmly believed that, that pu public engagement of science, as we call it now, yes. describing what we do as scientists is, value, is, is not only valuable, but necessary. I mean, he, following Carl Sagan, actually, one of my great heroes, he said that we, we live in democracies, and, and democ in democracies which are entirely based, essentially, on science. Everything, every day, from medical science to communications, flying an aircraft, whatever it is, our civilization is based on science. And if we get to the point where our civilization, where the people in democracy don't have any contact with science at all, not necessarily understanding, but mm. just understanding of what it's trying to do and the thought processes that you need to go through, then we have a democratic crisis. And of course, I think we're seeing that at the moment and we, we have to fight through it. And one of the ways is to think more carefully. Yes, and, and uh, I suppose pay more attention to the people who spend a lot of time thinking more carefully, which leads me to my <laughs> final question, Professor Brian Cox. How come he never won a Mo Nobel Prize? Um, because uh, probably Hawking radiation is probably the the key thing, as I said, this, this yes. idea that black holes evaporate. We're just beginning to have the technology to start to test those theorems that he's famous for. So the Nobel Prize was awarded last year for the discovery of the collision of two black holes. Um, and this uh, the idea that when black holes collide, there are ripples in the fabric of the cosmos called gravitational waves. And we can now detect them. And last oh. time I saw him, actually, at his 75th birthday celebration, he was talking. This is, this is what he's like. So even at the age of 75, you might think he'd have retired. But no, <laughs> he was talking about how excited he was that we'd finally got the technology to start exploring some of his predictions in ah, real detail. So, so if, if, we'd see, if we see it, if we see that his theorems are correct but, but by observation then, then he would certainly have got the Nobel Prize and that that ties things up very neatly for, for, for us laymen the theoretical physics are, are calculations effectively that demonstrate the inevitability of phenomena but we haven't actually viewed the phenomena yet that is something we can look forward to in the in the decades to come yeah, and, and Nobel Prizes tend to be awarded when... Uh, the, Peter Higgs is a good example. Yes. Higgs both on. He, he waited 50 years until we built the Large Hadron so Collider. So proved its existence, but nobody could see it. And only when you can see it do you get the gong. Yeah, cause it, that, that, because it, the, the, fa the, the great thing about science is that, uh, as, as the great Richard Feynman, a great scientist, once said, it doesn't matter who you are or what your name is or what your position is. If what you say disagrees with nature, you are wrong. And, that, and that, that's the key to science. Science, but it should also be the key to politics. It's a very <laughs> important lesson.